This video might change the way you think about Cartesian products. Let's begin with the usual way to think about them. The Cartesian product of R with itself is the plane R2. We usually think of it as a set of points with two coordinates, x and y. And we've probably spent a good deal of our mathematical career thinking about relationships between x and y that result in curves. If we cross R2 with R again, then we obtain R3. We'll call that three space. Its elements are ordered triples with coordinates x, y, and z. And in calculus, we spend most of our time here studying curves and surfaces. If we had a fourth coordinate, then we've got a typical element of R4. Probably the most famous example of four-dimensional space is Minkowski space, which is the setting for special and general relativity. So Rn intuitively is just the set of all ordered n-tuples, in other words, points with n slots. This is a great way to think about Cartesian products of finitely many sets. Let's see how it goes when we look at infinite Cartesian products. The smallest infinity is the size of the natural numbers. Sometimes this infinity is called omega. We can think of omega as the set that has elements called 0, 1, 2, and onward, just like the natural numbers. Omega is said to be the smallest countably infinite set. Here countably infinite means that I could count the number of elements in omega if I could grow a finger every second for the rest of eternity. What is r omega? Previous intuition said this should be the product of a countably infinite number of copies of the reals. So its elements should look like an infinitely long tuple. And that works fine. A larger infinity than omega is called omega 1, which is uncountable and at most the size of the reals. What do elements of r omega 1 look like? Well, now we've got a problem. We can't use the slot or tuple idea because omega 1 is uncountable. So that means that it cannot be enumerated. Let's look at a different view that relates our tuples to functions. Interpret 2 as something called an ordinal number. I'm following John von Neumann's ideas here, where 2 is a set that has two things in it, but more importantly, it has a first thing called 0 and a second thing called 1. Now consider a function x, where I input a number from my set 2, in other words 0 or 1, and it outputs a real number. So x is a function that sends 0 to some real number and sends 1 to some real number. We can identify this function x with the ordered pair consisting of its outputs. The first coordinate is x of 0, and the second coordinate is x of 1. In other words, we can think of this function x as being this point in the plane. Conversely, if I start with a point in the plane, say its coordinates are x sub 0 and x sub 1, then I could define a function x so that when I plug 0 into x, I get x sub 0, and when I plug 1 in, I get x sub 1. The moral of the story is that the set R2 can be identified with the set of all real valued functions on two inputs. Now let's interpret 3 as an ordinal number. So it's a set that has three things, but more importantly, it has a first thing called 0, a second thing called 1, and a third thing called 2. Consider a function x that inputs an element from our set 3, and it outputs a real number. So in other words, x is a function that sends 0 to some real number, x sends 1 to some real number, and x sends 2 to some real number. And we can identify this function x with the ordered triple consisting of its outputs. In other words, we can think of this function x as being some point in space. Conversely, given any point in space, say its coordinates are x0, x1, and x2, we can define a function x from the ordinal number 3 to the reals by sending 0, 1, and 2 to each of x0, x1, and x2 respectively. The moral here is that the set R3 can be identified with the set of all real valued functions on three inputs. You get the pattern. If we consider n as an ordinal, an n-tuple corresponds to a function on the set n. As before, the n-tuple and the function x are just different perspectives on doing the same job, which is picking out n real numbers. Now consider the countably infinite case. A typical element of r omega looks like a point with a countably infinite number of coordinates. And as before, 
This corresponds to a real valued function whose domain is omega. In other words, our omega is just the set of all real valued functions whose domain is omega. If you look closely at that, you notice that the outputs x0, x1, x2, etc., they form a sequence of real numbers. This function perspective is typically how sequences are defined in a real analysis class. So our omega is the set of all sequences of real numbers. Finally, let's consider the uncountably infinite case. Now the tuple idea is out, but the function idea is in. In other words, a typical element of r omega one, that should just be a function x. And x is some well-defined way to pick out an uncountable amount of real numbers. In other words, for each alpha and omega one, x associates alpha to some real number x sub alpha. Thus, r omega one is just the set of real valued functions whose domain is omega one. Now you can try to visualize an element of r omega one just like you would visualize a function from college algebra or from calculus. You think about its graph in the plane. So to recap, the function perspective is another way to think about elements from Cartesian products, and it's really the only way you should think about elements from infinite Cartesian products. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching.